So before, um, before I would just like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land in which we join for the seminar today. I give recognition to their proud traditions, vibrant culture and continued connection with the water and community. And I would like to extend my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and um, of other elders that may be joining with us today. So um, we've got our support team with Annie here today and um, she'll help with quest questions in the background. I've also got Caitlin doing social media and our hashtag is WBS2020. So I've got a few people that are online. If they could just turn your cameras off and mute while we've got the guest speakers on, that would be great. So the camera is just yep, down the bottom on the left hand side. Um, the questions you can put in the meeting chat room on the right, if you like. Um, and also there'll be a survey at the end of these presentations. And we'd really appreciate if you could uh, do that. There'll be a link on that uh, towards the end. So. First speaker I've got here today is Hannah Old and she's from Parks Vic and she's been a ranger for three years at the Garryward um, Grampians National Park. Uh, her focus is on vol volunteers and in the environmental program uh, uh, for the National for Vic's Parks. She's been instrumental in supporting the Bush Kinder program, which is um, she'll be speaking about. And she feels it's a privilege to be a ranger where she is in such a remarkable landscape. And I can concur that uh, the Grampians are a remarkable um, environment to be living in. And also, uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting Hannah as a ranger in the um, Deep Lead Nature Reserve doing uh, bush walks with um, the Iron Barks with one of my land care groups. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you, Hannah, and I'll just turn my screen off to make sure the bandwidth's all good. Thanks very much, Hannah. Thanks, Andrea. Um, well, welcome everybody. And th uh, firstly, thanks to the Wimmera Biodiversity Seminar for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, there's a few, of course, we're all online, so there's going to be some technical difficulties, no doubt. So if we can all just be patient um, through the slides and things like that, we'll see how we go. But um, first, I'm going to share my screen. Good audio. There we go. Um, and um, the acknowledgement of country actually isn't going to be done by myself today. Um, I have some uh, little children who actually do their acknowledgement of country um, before they walk on the lands of Gary Word country. So um, I've filmed that for us today and it's something that I um, would really like to share with everybody. So I'll start by sharing um, this acknowledgement of country. And if someone can just confirm that you can hear this one, once I press play, that would be really great. Thanks. Our to Gary Word country. Thank you for that. Yep, we can hear Hannah. We can hear that. Thank We acknowledge, we acknowledge the Jabberon and Yabba Yali people, and Yabba Yali people on, whose land we live and play. on whose land we live and play. It is now our job to look after it all. It is now our job to help look after it all. Thank you. That's beautiful. Well done, everybody. Wonderful. So that's um, the acknowledgement of country. Um, the kinder children do every um, every session before going out on country, which is um, quite amazing. So um, let me see if I get this started. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you um, about the bush kinder at the Grampians National Park. It's held in the southern Grampians um, by the Dunkeld Kindergarten. Um, and I'll be talking to you, um, sorry, I just don't know how to skip. There we go. Um, so a little bit about who we are, um, about this bush kinder. Um, so my name's Hannah. I've been a ranger here at um, Grampians National Park for coming up to four years. My focus is within the environmental um, management team and the environmental, um, uh, sorry, environmental um, education team and the volunteer management team as well. So um, my role is quite diverse. Um, 
each day is definitely different and um, it's uh, pretty an amazing landscape to be a part of. Um, Deb can't be with us today. She's the uh, founding kindergarten teacher of the Dunkeld Bush Kinder. Um, she's actually teaching with the kids today. So um, she apologises she can't be here. So I'm speaking on, um, on our behalf. But um, Deb's been teaching for 24 years at the Dunkeld Kinder um, and she started the Bush Kinder seven years ago along with Kim Burgess. And those two women are just phenomenal at what they do um, and they are really... Um, really push for environmental education and they have um, been doing a fantastic job. So in um, uh, for 2020 we have 12 students at the Dunkeld Bush Kinder um, and they are all little legends in their own right. So um, we also would like to acknowledge Bruce. He's our bus driver and he gets us there safely um, every fortnight. So thanks Bruce. Um, so what is Bush Kinder? Uh, so every year um, Deb uh, emails or calls me at the start of the year and she will confirm that um, we would like to hold, uh, she would like to hold a Bush Kinder um, in the Southern Grampians mm -hmm. and the way that it works is that um, we will go out onto site into Gary Word and we will have a look at um, a site that is suitable for uh, outdoor learning for the um, for the kids. And so um, Parks Victoria have actually been uh, delivering bush kinders for eight years. And we actually now have 70 registered kindergartens across the state who go out onto country and um, hold a bush kinder. And that's a pretty phenomenal amount of kindergartens that want to be a part of this program. It actually doesn't include um, the council parks or the uh, kindergartens that get involved in the Royal Botanic Gardens as well. So I, I reckon that there's more than 70 kindergartens um, actually involved in the Bush Kinder Program. So today I'm going to be specifically talking about the Dunkeld Bush Kinder. Um, and so it'll be about how we have been running it for seven years um, and, it, and, it, and it will vary across the state. So as I said, Deb would uh, email or call me and we'll go out onto country and uh, we have a look at the site and the, uh, the impact that uh, from, from the last year and we have a look at um, where we might like to hold um, the new bush kinder. And so we look at tree risk, um, we look at uh, a site that's going to be suitable for the kids to learn in. Um, so we don't want it to be uh, full of dense vegetation. We sort of want it to be open woodland so that we don't uh, you know, lose a child um, or uh, the tree risk is quite minimum. Um, so after we uh, sort of both agree on a site, we sort of um, draw a bit of a rough boundary. And uh, once we do that, um, I'll then have another ranger come with me and we'll do um, an actual proper tree risk assessment. Um, if we need to drop limbs, we will, but we try to choose a site that we don't have to disturb too much, but we also need to make sure that it's safe for um, children to be and play in playing um, for long periods of time. Um, so the bush kinder is actually delivered from terms two and three, so in the middle of the year when the weather is a little bit kinder towards us. Um, we do that because the only there's a few things that will stop a bush kinder from going ahead, and that's actually wind and an emergency. So um, in the middle of the year, we do um, come across rain and puddles, and so that doesn't actually stop the children from attending bush kinder, which is um, pretty fantastic. Um, so once we've found the site and we've um, we've picked the dates, uh, Deb will send them to me, and I will attend the first and last session and also a session in the middle, but this is completely delivered by Deb. She's the um, at the forefront, she's making sure that the kids um, get on the bus and that, that the bus is actually um, arrived on time with all the students there. And um, so PV will um, assist where possible, but this program is actually driven by the kindergartens. And so um, in the first session, um, you don't have a lot of time with the children because their attention span is about 3.5 seconds. I've timed it. And um, 
you spend a lot of time playing with the children. But when I say play, it's more about teaching as well. So um, in the first session, we'll talk about the acknowledgement of country and why that's important. You know, the kids are here to protect the park. They, of course, can be a part of the park and learn um, what it, uh, all the amazing things that, that are around them, the flora, the fauna and those sorts of things. But um, they really need us to, um, to learn about how to um, to be in the environment in a respectful way. And um, that's sort of my job in, at, the, at the first session is to come in. And um, Deb also really um, instills that in the kids as well. Um, they come there and they say, you know, we're not allowed to start digging and we're not allowed to pick things. And so that they know um, how to protect the park already. So it's, um, it's very amazing what these kids already know. Um, so we're introducing the um, the kids to an outdoor classroom and so they won't have those four walls around them and so uh, they will start learning about um, the elements that are around them, you know, the sun, sunscreen, hats and how to protect themselves and um, those sorts of things. So they'll turn up and they'll be out there for about three hours and in that three hours they'll have access to a toilet. Um, Deb brings the toilet, there'll be a boundary around the bush kinder where the kids know that they're not allowed to go outside of. Um, they know about snakes, they know about spiders. And so we talk to the kids about risk and that we don't try and, um, there are risks that we try and eliminate the best um, possible way, but we also are encouraging children to, you know, climb a tree and understand risk and to sort of um, understand that for themselves. So um, toys actually aren't brought into the bush kinder site. The only things that are brought into the site are the toilet, their snacks and guidebooks. And so, um, you know, I look at a guidebook and I get quite overwhelmed with all the different species. So if you give it to a four year old, you can imagine the things that they must be thinking. Um, so we're teaching them about country and it's just um, about child led learning, inquiry and play. And um, yeah, it's really about introducing introducing them to um, the national park in a way that they can start protecting it. So I'll just talk a little bit about the framework because a lot of people might think that you know a bush kinder the children are just out there playing and and they you know what's the purpose of bush kinder and I really want to um, make sure that you understand that um, this framework has come from Parks Victoria and um, there is a significant amount of purpose to, as to why um, Parks Victoria supports bush kinders and why we encourage it within um, this organisation. So the first, um, this sorry, this has come from our um, bush kinder handbook, which I'll go into a little bit later. So I've just pulled these from the handbook and I'll just go into them quite briefly. But um, for identity, we're trying to form and build connections and relationships um, with these children and so that, they're going to be doing this with their classmates as well. You know, they haven't met these other 12 um, children and they don't really know Deb or Kim. And so it's about building relationships, but we're trying to build them in a positive way in terms of sustaining the environment and protecting it. And so when they come in, you know, they're only taking photos and they're only um, leaving their footprints. We're really giving them the opportunity to share their identity. So at, at the age of four, you know, they might not really have an identity, but we're allowing them to, to begin creating it. And, and you can see that every time within the bush kinder, um, all these little identities that are being formed and they start to share them in a safe environment. Um, and so it's a safe area to play, explore and learn. And it's um, such a wonderful thing to, to see and to be a part of. So um, the community, uh, this area is actually affected by cinnamon fungus um, and so uh, is some other areas throughout the park. And um, that's the first thing we teach the children is that um, one of the first things, they'll actually get off the bus and they'll lean against the bus and um, they'll raise their feet and Deb comes along and she sprays their feet with um, PhytoClean and it actually kills anything on the bottom of their shoes and that's a requirement Parks Victoria asks the kindergarten um, to spray your shoes before and um, uh, before entering and after leaving. So um, we start to teach the children about the effects and the impact that we as humans can have on the environment 
But if we want to enjoy this environment, if we want to start learning and playing in the environment, we really need to understand that um, we are going to have an impact. However, we can reduce our impact, and this is one of the one of the ways that we can um, we can do it as well. And so um, we really want these children to understand caring for country. Um, that's what we're here for as rangers, and we're trying to instill that in these children. And it's um, sometimes it can seem overwhelming, but um, some these children are so fantastic at wanting to protect things and come in and learn about the site. Um, it's it's fantastic to see. Um, sometimes they'll go on a little bushwalk, and on this bushwalk um, they'll see rubbish and they'll learn about picking up rubbish. And I've heard stories that once they go out with their families, um, they'll start picking up rubbish on the weekend, you know, and they learn about country and that they actually want to protect it and the impacts that humans are having. So um, it's really uh, fantastic to hear that these children are actually uh, taking, this in, taking this home. Parents can actually visit Bush Kinder and we encourage parents to as well. Um, they'll get dragged around the site and they'll get told where the echidna diggings are, where, where the orchids are, or, um, you know, the, the kids are really teaching their parents and that's um, also a really positive thing that we see and that we're encouraging that we hope these children will um, instill this um, throughout their lifetime, but also whoever they um, meet. So by teaching these children about protection and how to care for country, we're providing them with the opportunity to learn from the beginning how to engage with the environment in a positive and sustainable way. Um, and we hope to encourage this behaviour to follow them throughout their life. Um, wellbeing is a massive one as well. Um, there, we've seen studies in, um, about uh, outdoor play and the benefits that it has. Healthy parks, healthy people, you know, we're really encouraging people to um, to get out into the environment. We know the benefits that it has on our physical and mental well-being, And so we really want to provide that with the children. So the first half an hour of a bush kinder is crazy. I'm not sure for those who have children, I don't, but I can just see what it's like there. And it is, it's, it's very crazy for the first half an hour. They're running around, they're excited. Um, they're sharing, they're playing games already, but um, after about half an hour, you know, we can start to hear the birds, we can start to hear the trees, the children have come down and, you know, you might see some of them playing by themselves or just walking around and there's just this sense of calm that just comes through the bush kinder after, um, you know, they've got all their energy out, of course. So, we're really um, mindful of their well-being, and um, that's why we don't bring toys into it. You know, it's not a very, um, I guess, stimulating environment where we have screens and things like that. We do um, actually bring cameras in, but I'll, I'll um, get into that a little bit later. Um, and we really want to support the children and and the kindergarten to have that experience because I can only assume that all of us um, are, are in the environmental field that we work in or that we recreate in. And, and we know that benefit of being outside and what it has, has on our mental and physical wellbeing. So we really wanna provide that for the children. Learning, this is um, pretty self-explanatory. Um, there is a lot of learning going on, especially for myself as well. Um, these children are like sponges and um, there's so many things that we can teach them. And I think that's the whole thing about bush kinder is teaching these kids about the environment. Gary Word is such an incredible landscape and it's I'm so privileged to work here. And the children um, live around in the community. And so that if they're going to be coming back into this environment, we really want them to understand that we're here to protect it um, and that we can, uh, you know, come into this environment, but we also need to understand our impact. And so they're learning about that um, from a very young age. Communication, um, we've, uh, I began a photo point monitoring program with these um, children so that we can build on their communication skills. Um, they're learning in different ways about, um, you know, how to communicate if they're hungry, thirsty, upset or angry because they're just in a different element, you know, they're, they're not in that um, four walled classroom where you click a button and the heating's on. You've got to wear gum boots, you need your raincoat um, and you need to have your snacks and things like that. So they're learning about um, how to communicate with adults and their friends. And then they go and take stories home to their parents and they say, mum and dad, I've done this today and we did that. And so it's just building on that communication and um, 
uh, for them as well. So they're really sharing those stories um, and, yeah, it's really fantastic to see. So I guess, um, you know, there used to be a bit of um, bubble wrap around children and it was um, parents were very, um, not all parents, um, can be quite scared about the risk to their child. Um, and I can understand that would be, um, you know, there are, it's a very high risk environment um, as well. But there was some studies um, that from the conversation and Latrobe universities and various universities where we see parents are very fearful of um, uh, what their children are doing basically and it's beyond the bubble wrap. So I've just um, taken a few of um, these headings, but I'd just like to highlight how much things are changing and how we're really seeing bush kinder implemented throughout or across the state and hopefully throughout the world. But um, we're seeing outdoor play increased um, because there are so many benefits and that just goes back to our mental and physical well-being. Um, and so outdoor learning has huge benefits for children and teachers, so why isn't it used more in schools? So we're really seeing that increase of outdoor learning because, excuse me, because the, um, the positives are there. And so more studies are um, starting to happen and we're really starting to see, um, to see those benefits. I didn't actually realise the time, so I'm just going to um, quickly whip through a few things because I've got a movie to show you about the actual bush kinder, but this is just their philosophy. Um, and Deb really drove this program. Um, and seven years ago, she uh, suggested to the parents, you know, we really want to go to bush kinder. And she actually, unfortunately, got abused by some of the parents in, a, in the supermarket. And that is because of the risk. And so parents didn't really understand what bush kinder was. And so um, to move past that, Deb actually um, said to the parents, right, give me um, all your questions and I'll answer them. And she um, mitigated all of the risks. And so the parents came to Deb with a list of questions <laughs> and she answered them. And then um, they were actually incorporated into a handbook. And so there's a Dunkeld Pushkin handbook that parents get every year to just uh, educate them about what their children are going to be doing excuse me, how to, um, we're going to keep their children safe. And part of that is, is Bruce. So the bus is actually kept there through the whole session. Um, it's very expensive. That is probably the only cost is the, um, is to have the bus there the whole time. But we want to make sure that the Dunkeld kinder, um, can be there and to, for it to actually happen in this bush kinder. So um, this is just part of their philosophy about um, some of the positive things that they're doing. And this is, I guess, Parks Victoria's philosophy as well. Um, and so how they've really come together about contact with nature is critical for our physical, mental, social and spiritual well-being. It has a positive effect on our ability to concentrate, to learn, to solve problems, to relax and to be creative. So we, so we know um, the benefits of um, the environment and what it has on us. However, being a ranger, we see the effects of um, human impact on the environment. And I think that um, there's a lot of work to be done on education and how we bring people into the environment in a respectful, sustainable way, because it is in our country. You know, it's, um, we're on the lands of the Jawa, Jali and Jabarong peoples, and we need to be respectful of that. So um, I think the kids are doing a tremendous job and um, you can just see how excited they get about being at Bushkinder each time. I'll just quickly touch on risk because it is um, a bit of a major concern of um, parents, I guess. Um, but it's just uh, what Bushkinder is. We actually encourage them to climb trees, jump from height, balance and sliding, allowing children to accept challenge and experience feelings of success and pride. So um, there are many benefits to, to risk-taking behaviour. And so we're providing a safe environment for the kids to think for themselves and to work it out. And you can just see um, the benefits of that as well and I just touched on before about um, how Debbie had a list of questions and um, and, and, and answered them all. She did such a fantastic job. 
So the photo point monitoring project is is something I started this year. Um, we the kids were sort of coming into bush kinder and yes they were learning but I just wanted to go that extra step further. Um, they have digital cameras um, which they take photos of. They've taken a few funny photos of myself in the past and so um, they've got a pretty amazing understanding of how to use a camera and so what I said um, to the children is they all paired up and I said go and take a photo of your favourite spot in the bush kinder and so they went and found their favorite spot and they took a photo and um, Deb printed those and then took a photo of the students and then put it on the back and so that was basically their um, photo of the landscape and we we're going to um, monitor how the landscape changed over time and what we wanted to do was take a photo every session um, and then the kids would have sort of like we'd create a video and they'd have it at the end however it was a little bit it was a little bit advanced for the kids. We found out um, pretty quickly, so we changed it. And we changed it to drawing. So they have their original photo and um, they go and stand at their spot um, every every fortnight and they talk to the talk to each other about what's changed. And I've just you stand back and you listen to some of the conversations and oh you walk away crying. It's just so hilarious to to hear some of the things that they say. But we're encouraging different skills here. So um, they're using uh, colours and colouring in and um, Deb's obviously written all the uh, things that the kids have noticed changing. So the bush is, grow um, is going to grow flowers. Um, and so they're understanding change in the environment and um, how things grow as well. And these are just some of the drawings I thought I'd show you. Um, Edwin's estimate of change. There's a bird's nest. And so they do these back at the kindergarten and they have um, some free time. This is what they choose to to do so this is the bush kinder handbook and it's um, a really fantastic tool that parks have created for kindergartens to understand what a bush kinder is um, because uh, yeah, so this is available on our website and I'd be more than happy to email it through to anyone. It's in a PDF format. Um, and yeah, it just gives uh, kindergartens a bit of an understanding of how Parks Victoria can support kindergartens. Um, we don't actually drive the program. We're just there to support kindergartens uh, go out onto country. So, just, I, I guess I could um, sit here all day and try and explain what the bush kinder is, but I've taken a video of um, of the bush kinder to to share with everyone today. Um, if someone can, yeah, just confirm again that everyone can hear this. That would be great. I can hear it. Pushing bugs, and I've got a no pulling plant, and no yes, So, Hannah, I am Debbie Millard, and I'm a kindergarten and I have been seven, so that's a fairly long time. And um, about seven years ago, we wanted to implement a bush kinder 
here. We thought we have the perfect spot to stand here at Bank of the Um, I'm Kim Burgess. I've been involved with Bush Kinder for seven years when we first started at UP. G'day, my name's Han. I'm a ranger here at Grampians National Park. Today we're in the southern Grampians at the Dunkeld Bush Kinder, and it is by far my favourite part of being a ranger is being out here with with the kids. We have 12 children enrolled in our group this year and three of those drive out from Huntington which just shows their commitment and how much they love our program. What do you like about Bush Kinder? What did you do at Bush Kinder? Well, we climbed it. We saw a lot of rocks, and I was a leader. Come here. I put my goggles on first, and then it's like. Hey, get up! Okay. Trees? Rock trees! Yeah. They don't like germs. Is that why we spray our shoes? Yes. So we don't spray germs. You know, you just you come out here and you just go, oh, you know, and it's just, and I think that maybe I wanted children to have that. What's it doing? Thanks for showing me. Yeah. Would you like to tell me your favourite thing about Bush Kinder? Mm-hmm. Okay. Hopefully that's given you a bit of an understanding of the um, kindergarten and um, uh, yeah, what we do and 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 why we do it. I um, know there's some questions and everything, so sorry if I've gone over. Um, uh, you're actually, yeah, I'm happy. You're actually you perfect timed. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Happy happy to take questions. Um, but if you would like, if you know of a kindergarten um, or if you have um, yeah, if you would like to know anything, um, that my email's on there. And also, um, if you know of a kindergarten statewide that's not locally to Gary Word, then um, there's an education at parks.vic.gov.au and they can um, also give you um, direction on how to be part of the Bush Kinder Program. But um, yeah, I'm happy to happy to take questions, Andrea. Okay, so I've got a probably uh, one question here is, do the kids ever go barefoot during bush kinder? Uh, no, they don't. Not that I know of. I just, no. It's probably better for beaches, I imagine. <laughs> um, the other question, so, yeah. And the other question is, do you bring materials for the kids to do drawings, which are, I think, yeah. Um, so the drawing's actually done back at kindergarten. So, um uh, the only material is the photo that they um, take in, and they have they stand there and they have a look. They have a look at what um, has changed. However, um, no, we don't bring in colouring things into Bush Kinder. That's um, the only thing we bring in is is the guidebook. Uh, no, that sounds good. And then the far one, another one I've got here. Does the teacher? plan for general learning objectives within that program. So incidental things like numbers and spatial awareness, um, not, nece- uh, in, not necessarily specific to the nature orientated jo- objectives. So are they doing broader learning? Um, that's probably more of a question for Deb and I can only assume so yes, like I attend the first, middle and last session um, and I, I can only assume Deb would Deb would plan those things around Bush Kinder because it's such a fund- fundamental program um, and offers benefits that would um, suit curriculum like that. Um, 
I would say, yeah, I would say yes. However, I can definitely check with Deb on um, how she plans those things. Oh, that's great because that comes from a kin teacher that's what uh, the past kinder teacher that's been watching. And then also, why is cinnamon fungus bad? The kids know, but could you tell us? Uh, I'm going to get tested here. This is great. Uh, so it's a disease <laughs> that, um, like a fungicide that actually attacks kangaroo grass trees and um, attacks their root system. And so, um, yeah, it's just a fungal disease that um, attacks it and just starts to um, disintegrate. And you can definitely tell within the environment, um, say if you're looking um, in the landscape and uh, it'll just be like someone's drawn a line across um, the landscape and you, you'll see cinnamon fungus on this side and not on that side. And it'll um, progress through um, soils or um, like in our feet on tracks and cars um, or animals as well. Um, and so it just slowly starts to um, yeah, break down the root system and, and, and kill the um, kill the plant. But if anyone else has a better explanation, I'd be more than happy if they can take over. So is that a big problem in the Grand Pins? Uh, yeah, so we do have, um, we are managing it. Um, and so some people might know about the Grand Pins Peaks Trail. And so, um, you know, uh, there are footpaths coming in through that as well. And so um, it's mainly through off track um, walking um, is, is when that mm. it, it would be uh, attacking in the environment. Um, so like they also do it down in the Great Ocean Walk and things like that. So um, it's more off track um, that it's an issue. And so a lot of our rangers have Fido Clean within their um, car or their vehicle and they spray their shoes if they're going um, before and after entering off track. Um, can I just add, Marion Pennycue, that it's been known about for many, many years. It's one of many uh, tree diseases. Uh, it also affects eucalypts and other species. Um, and if you want um, a, a good reading on it, Tree Diseases of Victoria by Mark Satall um, was written by the Forestry Commission of Victoria back in the um, 1980s. Thank you so much for that. That's right. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Mariam. And then actually someone's asking, what sort of toilet do you provide for the kids when you're out there? Uh, parks don't provide the toilet. Um, Deb does. And so it's a um, just kind of like a potty. And then it's just there's a, um, a, a camp, um, looks like a camp shower, I guess, that the kids go into. And um, yeah, I actually haven't been in there, um, but it's just a yeah, potty. I know that's good. It's good to know all these like, ins and outs, I suppose, of when you're trying to get a small group of children together. And um, obviously, you, you say you're, you assess risk. So it's good that people are asking these sort of questions. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any more questions out there. I think that's I've a asked all of them. Um, someone said that this video has made them smile. And I think um, I smile with the little one with these goggles. Is that always a thing that they want to wear goggles or? Edwin's actually a bit of a legend. He, um, when he was saying that those three things that I didn't tell him to say that he he completely surprised me um, with those beautiful things. And he wears the ski goggles because um, the xanthoreas are actually at his eye height, and he. I think he might have got, he walked into one at one stage or he just wears them because he's worried that um, he'll get um, poked in the eye. So, yeah, that's the reason he wears the ski goggles. <laughs> it, I mean, that's the most beautiful reason because children, I mean, they make you look at the environment differently as much as you're getting them to um, look at the environment. They're fresh eyes, which is always um, so beautiful Absolutely. to be around. Yeah, definitely. So actually, I if you can if anyone sees this chat, there's someone's put in the uh, actually Pauline's put in the diseases in Victoria book, so you can um, have a look at that if anyone was interested. Um, and if there's no more questions, I I will wrap this up. But just saying that everyone needs a Bruce in their life, I think, to get those you know your objectives met um, when you want to, when you've got a great idea. So it's great that you've got Bruce the bus driver um, as your backup. And the ideas that I got from what you're saying is the sense of calm for the children. What a great thing to bring. Um, Self-directed learning. I mean, they take that then through life. So, it, you know, it's so beneficial to have that. And then the idea of story, um, you know, that's a very human thing is that's how we pass tradition on is through story. 
and uh, that the fact that you're actually getting them to already think about that is wonderful. And then the last thing is place. You know, such a very wonderful thing to be grounded in is place and what a lovely place for them to find their place, you know, find their spot in um, in their beginnings of their life and their, and their learning. So thank you very much for that, Hannah. That was just um, fantastic and I hope it gave people inspiration into thinking of how they can include little ones um, in the environment more. Yeah, they're very important little people. But um, thanks for everyone attending today. I um, hope you in enjoyed it. But um, yeah, we're working really hard with these kids and they're also working really hard with us. So um, it's forming some really great connections. So um, I'm sorry Debbie couldn't be here. She does um, wish she could, but uh, thanks everyone. No, thank, you. thank you very much for your time today, Hannah. It's been an absolute pleasure. So we'll get on to our next guest speakers, but if I can just ask people to turn their cameras off and sound down when the next guest speaker comes on so that we can have as good a bandwidth as possible. Uh, so I was just thinking, um, I had favourite memories in kinder and uh, with Miss Sophie and amongst those memories is uh, the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar. So with that, I'm going to segue into, into introducing Kate. Are you with us, Kate? Can't see your... Oh, hi, Kate. This is So I've got Kate Pierce here with us today. And I'm not sure if I call you a lepidopterist or a herpetologist, but you've got the best job in Melbourne because you're, especially in winter, in that balmy uh, butterfly house. So Kate oversees um, the program for the zoo's invertebrates, including the Lord Howe Island in stick insect. Is that correct? Yeah. And, you know, and you've just, I mean, we've got a little bit of background information, that idea of uh, the hearts, which you can probably go into. It sounds beautiful. Um, and so without further ado, I would love to introduce Kate um, to talk to us about what she does. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, my name's Kate Pierce. I'm the coordinator of ectotherms at Melbourne Zoo. So I, my predominant focus is invertebrates, but I also oversee the herpetofauna as well, so reptiles and amphibians. But today I'm just going to give an overview on um, our invertebrate programs. So can you see that? Can yes, you we can. Yes, oh, yes we can. Right. Yes, we can. Okay. Wonderful. Can. Um, so that little superstar there is the uh, male Cairns birdwing. That's one of our most popular. Uh, as you can see, I'm in the butterfly house. Um, so Melbourne Zoo's butterfly house has um, been open since 1985, but that's not all we do. Um, we have three broad categories of um, invertebrates that we look after. So there's the butterflies, um, our encounter invertebrates. So those ones are used in the classrooms. And then our conservation animals. So at the moment, our one on site is the Lord Howe Island stick insect. Uh, I'll start by saying that I feel really proud and honoured to work for an organisation that takes invertebrates seriously from all aspects, from display to welfare to education and conservation. Um, it's quite, it's a pretty rare thing, um, and I'm like really lucky to be here. So we'll start off with butterflies. As I said, um, we're quite well known for our butterfly house. Uh, it opened on uh, the 11th of December 1985, so that'll be 35 years this year. I remember coming to it with my nana when I was a little girl. Um, the commitment was made back then to breed everything on site. So that's pretty unique for us. Um, most butterfly houses around the world just buy in the pupa stage and then let the animal emerge and fly that animal within their house. We do the whole life cycle here. So you might be able to see behind me, but there's some potted plants on the stands. Um, those are the egg laying plants. So we fly around 15 species, depending on the time of year. Um, and each species has their own plant that they feed on as a caterpillar. Um, some have only the one, some might have two or three. 
so each week we swap out those plants. Uh, we keep what we can, depending on what numbers we need in the house, but more importantly, what's happening with the plants down at the plant nursery. So we have two horticulture staff that just do our food plants for the invertebrates. And for each species of butterfly, there's probably, you know, three, 400 potted plants. And then for something like the Lord Howe Island stick insect, there's probably 1,500. Uh, we release between 60 and 80 a day into the butterfly house. Um, and at any one time, there's between six and 800 on the wing flying. So we do count them. Uh, we count them every four weeks. We just did it on Saturday, just gone. Uh, we turn down the temperature, choose a species each, and then go around and count them all. Uh, and it's around 23,000 that we release into the butterfly house every year. So whilst we've been closed, we've taken the opportunity to start a butterfly behaviour research project to see how they use the space. And we'll compare that to when visitors come back as well. So it's a pretty unique opportunity. Um, again, because we breed everything on site with potted plants, we're able to do that. We're able to carry on breeding. Other butterfly houses around the world would have just stopped ordering pupae at this time. So our next category of invertebrates, um, mostly insects at the moment, is our encounter insects. Uh, so these guys, we breed all of them. So you can see the middle picture is a praying mantis. That's with their Utheka at the top picture. And then the bottom one is when it, when it hatches. And you can see there's hundreds of them. Uh, so these ones are displayed in our learning nodes. And each learning node is geared up for a different um, age of school children. So we call it Education for Conservation at Zoos Victoria. And we use the Connect, Understand, Act model. Uh, so the idea is that the kids connect with an amazing experience and then understand through hands-on experience or, or being in the space to, to experience that. And then act by using the knowledge that they've, they've taken in that practical situation or when we're applying uh, the Connect, Understand, Act model uh, outside of the classroom, it might be with um, a visitor where we want them to connect with something like a stick insect especially the Lord Howe Island stick insects. So we try and get them to have some empathy towards the animals. And then there would be an act component that comes later. So we also have, as you can imagine at the moment, um, school children can't come to the zoo. So there's an online um, teaching aids that are available through the website. Um, and we also run a fighting extinction schools program where we have partnerships with different schools. And every year those fighting extinction schools come into the zoo and have a showcase where they show us all the amazing things that they've done for, um, for educating themselves and others on our, either our conservation programs or on welfare or on biology. It depends on the school, but there's been some super cute, you know, puppets made and drawings. And one, there was, uh, the challenge was to engineer I think it was a tiger exhibit or something, and it was just phenomenal that these kids, what these kids came up with. Okay, so conservation programs. Uh, so we we are now on our second conservation master plan. Uh, the most recent one launched in 2019, and you can find it on the website. Um, the Lord Howe Island stick insect has actually been on site for longer than the conservation master plan. So the idea with the um, with the fighting extinction species or the threatened species that are within this plan was that they would all be Victorian species. But there are a few exceptions and our Lord Howe is one of them and the Tasmanian Devils is another. So the Lord Howe on stick insect was once really, really common on Lord Howe. Um, they were everywhere. They were used as fishing bait um, and they were found in people's roofs and things like that. Um, but in 1918, a ship ran aground and uh, ship rats got onto the island and basically the, all of them were gone within a decade or so. So it was considered extinct, but then there was rumours of a big black insect being found on Ball's Pyramids. You can see the photo there. It's very much a pyramid. Um, it's quite long, but it, it is a pyramid shaped. Um, in 2001, a very small population was discovered on Ball's Pyramid by New South Wales Office of Environment Heritage and the Lord Howe Island Board. Um, and they were just hanging on on a bush, a Maluka Howiana, which is endemic to Lord Howe Island. 
Uh, and there was, I think they only saw, I think it was four or five. Um, and from there, they looked for people within Australia that had experience with breeding invertebrates and they chose us to be part of that program. So in 2003 on Valentine's Day, uh, two pairs were collected on Ball's Pyramid. And when I say they were collected, it sounds, you know, easy. It's not. Ball's Pyramid is extremely hard to get onto. Um, stick insects are nocturnal, so you have to be there overnight. Uh, I've been there myself. It's pretty hectic. Um, so one pair was brought to Melbourne Zoo in those early days and another pair went to a breeder in New South Wales. Uh, we ended up getting the offspring from that pair in New South Wales as well. So our main population is derived from only four founders um, and we are now up to the 16th generation with that group. So we were lucky enough in 2017 to get another female. We called her Vanessa after the rock climber that found her. There was a big expedition um, organised through Lord Howe Island, New South Wales, OEH and um, Australian Museum. And we managed to get one female. So we can only collect 10% of the population. And on that particular survey, we only saw 17 animals, hence why we could only bring one back. But she was paired up with a male before we took her off Bull's Pyramid. Um, the stick insect itself has a pretty regular stick insect life cycle. So you can see the eggs in the top left corner. They look like the Melaleuca seeds. Um, from there, they're in the egg for about six months and they hatch into these teeny tiny little green nymphs. Uh, when they're nymphs, they'll climb up to the top of a bush so that they're camouflaged in those leaf tips. Um, and they will only be active during the day, even though they'll be visible only be active during the night, sorry, even though they're visible during the day. As they get older, they um, molt and change colour until they're inevitably black. So the one on the right hand side is the female. So she's got a longer body with an ovipositor. And then the, uh, the smaller picture in the middle at the bottom is the male's hind legs. So they have spurs, which we think they use to mate guard and nest the, uh, guard the nest boxes as well. Or in the wild, it would have been a tree hollow. We manage them pretty tightly at the zoo. Um, so we have all the egg pots set up slightly differently. We have one little group where we weigh and measure each egg and allow all those to hatch. And then another group where we hatch what we need to keep the population going. All the nymphs are measured upon hatching and they moved into the smaller enclosures on the top left. We'll keep 30 per enclosure. They'll stay in there until they're at sub-adult stage. So the top right corner, you can see that they've got a darker green and then there's kind of a bronzy color. Uh, this is where they start clumping together. So they use that uh, we think as some kind of uh, predator avoidance. So if you clump together, you're only going to lose one or two from the outside because there's a few smaller insectivorous birds on um, Lord Howe Island. Then once they're that bigger sub-adult stage, they move into our free range glass houses. So in those glass houses, the nest boxes are in there with endemic food plants. So we have four species that we feed to them. Um, and then they come out at night, do what they want to do, and then go back into their nest boxes. So you can see a big huddle down the bottom right corner. So that's pretty normal. Their favorite is the ficus. Um, so in that nest box closer to there, you'll see most of them in there. Okay, and then in 2019, uh, we added two new species. So one of the new species is the Keys Matchstick Grasshopper. Um, so this grasshopper is pretty cute. It's very small, probably about, you know, this big. Um, they're flightless, so they can't move very far. And they hadn't actually been seen in, in Victoria for quite a few decades. Melbourne Uni had been doing a lot of work with them on a genetic, genetic side of things. Um, and there was a lot of field notes going back 50 years or so. So they knew where they should have been found and they'd been going out on surveys looking, looking, looking and they couldn't find them. Anyway, in September 2019, uh, Melbourne Uni went out to Omeo and managed to find some still alive, still breeding in these tiny little roadside habitats. So that photo on the right hand side is pretty much how wide that little bit of habitat is. 
Um, so they feed on native daisies like chrysocephalums, xerocrisms, and also bidgiewidgie, but there'll probably be other species that they feed on as well. Uh, Melbourne Uni, as I said, has had a go with um, breeding them. They're doing really well. So you can see the cute little setups with just a, a little egg pot and, um, and some food plants as well. Um, so one of their main, well, their main threat is habitat loss, like most things. In this case, they were known to be found in cemeteries. So in older cemeteries where there hadn't been a lot of vegetation management. That has changed over the years now. People want lawns and neat looking cemeteries so that that remnant um, habitat is is no longer there. The next one is the golden rain blue butterfly. So this is your butterfly. Um, we did a trip out in January 2019 and we met up with people from Parks Vic and Delp and we were super lucky to see quite a few of these guys flying. Um, it was yeah, a huge privilege to see them. They're very, very sweet. Um, so they were described as a new species in 2004. Um, so with this species and with the Keys matchstick grasshopper, within the conservation master plan, it's, it's more of a prospectus document in that this is what we would like to do with the programs, depending on funding. So as you could all appreciate during um, COVID-19, um, there isn't a lot of funding. So most of the work that we've done so far with Keys and with the Golden Raid Blue is more background research so that once we have funding, we're ready to go. So I've been in contact with several other zoos that have um, conservation breeding programs. Uh, Chester Zoo, they do the large heath butterfly, Florida Museum, that's a picture of them in the um, middle bottom there. Um, that one, they use a lot of volunteers. So there's little small containers where they've got all the larvae in each of those and they have to feed them all individually. Um, San Diego, they do the Kino checker spot butterfly and Minnesota Zoo. So that we've got a, some information from a range of different butterfly um, family groups, which we could then apply back to these should we get them into captivity. Um, also been looking at designing a lab as well that would fit for both of those species. Um, with the food plant for this one, it's called Myoporum parvifolium. So it's relatively easy to grow. Um, it's probably been grazed out of where they were naturally found, but it's actually a really easy garden plant to grow. So that will also be another one that will be amazing would be for the community to really get behind the Golden Raid Blue. Um, there's other programs that are similar that are run in Australia. The Eltham Copper Butterfly is one that's um, pretty well known. Uh, the community are really behind that butterfly. They plant the Bursaria, which is the food plant for them. Um, they contribute to yearly counts of the larvae. They go out and they help manage the food plants. So they have some problems with um, weedy species. So bridal creeper will grow over the burst area. Also the burst area needs to be quite small. So around two meters to be usable for the um, butterfly. There's also the Richmond bird wing as well. That's another one up in Queensland where the community's got really on board and planted that food plant. So for butterflies, it's, it is, can be as simple as that as planting their local food plant that they feed on. In this case, it's a nectaring plant as well as a food plant for the caterpillar. So, so it's a, a really amazing thing that the community could get behind. We are also hoping to do surveys with them as well. Again, this is a budget thing. We do hope that we'll be able to get to it soon. Okay, community campaigns. Um, we run quite a few community campaigns at Zoos Victoria. This one is quite a new one. It's one that's currently in development. Um, it's called Under the Magnifying Glass. So we've started again doing background work. Um, the top left uh, photo there is a, um, is a diagram from RMIT. So RMIT partnered up with the City of Melbourne and ran a program called The Little Things That Run the City, which is very fitting. Um, and they looked at invertebrates through um, different gardens throughout the city. 
and then they narrowed it down to butterflies in the city as well. So this diagram shows that um, in the red, they're all the uh, exotic plants and in the green, that's the local uh, native plants. And then the purple one is the cabbage white and the blue one is the um, is our uh, native butterflies. So you can kind of see the relationship there. It's pretty, it's pretty hectic to look at, but basically it shows that um, in the city, both native and exotic plants are beneficial to our local butterflies. Um, from there, they then set up pollinator observatories at Westgate Park and um, the Botanic Gardens. And we were hoping to be the next one on the list for the pollinator observatories. It was going to start happening this winter, but again, unfortunately, we were closed and with COVID, we couldn't do that. So we're workshopping some more ideas about how we can get this started. Um, we're hoping to do some wildlife gardening um, campaign where, where we're looking at people, uh, looking at what's in their own garden, especially post bushfires and during COVID time where we're at home more. What's in your garden? What can you do to help the, the native animals in your own garden? Bogong moths. So bogong moths, while they're not listed as an endangered species, uh, they're the food for endangered species. So for the last three years or so, uh, very few bogong moths have made it up into the alpine regions. Uh, that's really important because uh, critically endangered animals like the mountain pygmy possum use bogong moths as a food source. Uh, so they come out of hibernation, they feed on the moths, and um, they'll also, they need that nutrition for their pouch young as well. So we launched the moth trucker last year, and um, we got 116 verified sightings and 187 that were other species. So the, the diagram on the left shows where all those sightings came from. So really coastal areas, but there are some out, you know, west as well, and a few from Adelaide and Tasmania. Um, and the top right one shows you what different types of moths that we were seeing. So the most common was the the lady moth, southern granny moth, that has a few different names, goat moth, and um, the emperor gum moth. So we think what was happening is people were seeing the bigger, spectacular moths and putting them in the moth tracker, hoping they're bogongs. But bogongs are actually little brown guys, not so spectacular, but I think they're pretty cute. Um, they have that dark bar down the sides of their forewing um, and a little kidney shape on the bottom. Uh, so this year we'll be launching it on the 21st of September, which is Monday. Uh, so if you go onto the website, which is hosted by Swift and was um, was made in a partnership with Federation University. Um, when you look at it now, it's blank. Um, so we're really putting the call out there for all Victorians, well, everyone, um, if you see a, a bogong moth to lodge that sighting and we'll be identifying those. The graph there on the right is um, the sightings over time from last year. And the green one is the verified ones. The red one is the unverified, so that's where we couldn't really see what they were. It might have been too blurry. So, you know, a good photograph will help us a lot more. Um, and the other species is blue. So some good things came out of the moth tracker last year. So there was 9.6% increase in recognition of bogon moths, 7.8% recognition of mountain pygmy possums, 10% um, identification for reducing light pollution. So we really paired it with um, turning your lights off at home last year um, and we found that people were taking that action. So that's data from the ACT. Uh, and on the right there, this is when bogong moths were found. I think it was in a, a ski lift at one of the ski resorts. So we did get some really useful, useful information coming back. Um, and that is, a, we use this kind of recognition tracking for all of our FE species. So going back to the Lord Howe Island stick insect, out in the public area, we have a big sculpture of the Lord Howe Island stick insect and their story out there interpreted for the visitors. We also do an encounter as well. So we found with them there was an increase in recognition as well, which is for a big black insect is pretty amazing because as humans, we're not normally empathetic towards big black insects, but in this case where 
people find out the amazing story, um, they can really relate to this animal and want to help save it. So that's it for my talk. I think the take homes here, we would really, really, really love to get lots and lots of lodgings for the Bogon moth and our moth tracker and to help your butterfly out in the Wimmera planting my porum parvifolium or the creeping bubiella would be really, really helpful. And hopefully one day we can increase our capacity in that space. Thank you. And down the bottom, I, I was asked earlier what that photo is. Um, that's the photo of the uh, legs of the Lord Howe Island stick insect and they've got heart shaped pads on their feet. So that links in for us with our Love Your Locals program, which is what Zoos Victoria is all about, is really celebrating local wildlife. So thank you. Oh, thank, oh, you, thank very you very much, much for, that, for that, Kate. Kate. Turn off. Um, um, I have got a few questions before we end today. So are there concerns for uh, or signs of inbreeding issues with the uh, captive population you have for the um, stick insect, um, given the small foundation size? Yes, yes and yes. Um, it's a really difficult one um, because it is a critically endangered animal and the habitat out on Bull's Pyramid, uh, Bull's Pyramid can be quite precarious. There's, um, there's some weed issues out there as well. Um, it's illegal to climb Bull's Pyramid, so we have to have a licensed team that go out there. Um, so we can't get out there very often. In fact, it's been twice in, what, 17 years. So it's a really difficult task. Um, as far as inbreeding signs, um, we are working on, at the moment, bringing in some of the genetics from that female, Vanessa, in 2017 into the general population. So we're kind of running three populations at once. We've got the original one, we've got the Vanessa population where we've kept it pure. So we're up to the, we're waiting on the third generation to hatch there. And then a hybrid population where we brought them two together. So there was a male from the Vanessa group and then the females from our older group that we put together. And recently we've done the opposite with a female from the Vanessa group and some males from the original group. So as far as what we've actually been seeing is our hatch rate goes down over time. So we are looking, we are analysing that data at the moment. The eggs have got a bit more brittle over time. So when you pick them up, they'll just crush in your hands. Um, and also we've had a few, some kind of morphological things. So we get these females that come with a, a that hatch out with a kinked abdomen. We think that could be genetic. So we've got a genetic research program happening at the moment with the Australian National University. So we've been sending genetic samples up there. Um, it looks complicated, uh, very complicated from what I understand. They could be um, hexaploid, so have multiple um, genes. And yeah, it's, it's taking a, quite some time to kind of nut that side of things out. So we're gonna, we're setting up at the moment another way to collect some data where we're going to have pairs from the hybrid population and from our original population and try and see what diversity is lost over time. So that's kind of a work in progress. It's taking some time to get through it, um, but it'll be amazing when we have more of that information. On the reintroduction, um, the rodent eradication has been done on Lord Howe Island. Uh, so the island needs to be two years rodent free before we can introduce the animal back onto Lord Howe Island. So we're really in the planning phases there. So we, again, we need to get more information on the genetics so that we can introduce robust animals back onto the island. And, you know, I've been following it just loosely and um, I think it was the eradication program last year, I think they said 42 tonnes of bait and 28,000 bait stations to get rid of those rats. And I think they even um, housed some of the um, more uh, vulnerable bird species to do that. Um, so really they're just waiting now for you. Is that right? That next stage, is there other people that are breeding these insects? Yeah, so with with the rona eradication, there were there was a lot of bait that was dropped, but it was in a couple of like I think it was one or two helicopter drops out on the mountain, on the mountains on either side of Lord Howe Island. And then within the settlement area the bait stations were continually topped up. Mm. Um so it was a lot of bait, but it was a short period of time. 
Um, yep. With the birds, that was Taronga Zoo that, that did that. So the wood hens were collected. They, they got wood hens from the settlement area as well, up in, as well as up in the mountains. So they had genetic diversity for those. I think it was around 100 birds. And then likewise with the currawongs, the currawongs I think was 100 and maybe 120 birds. Um, and they were kept at back of house aviaries. I was lucky enough to see that set up. It was incredible, just incredible what they were mm. doing with the birds. Um, and they're all back out now. So they're all safe back out there. Um, and sorry, what was the part of the other question? The other part of the question? What oh, no, that, uh, I think, yeah, yep. Yes, so the island needs to be rodent free for two years. So the last rodent activity was seen around December last year. So it'll be two years post that. Um, we're only one part of the puzzle. So I think it, there's around 13 species of birds that have gone extinct on um, Lord Howe Island. So they're looking at other bird species and how that fits in. Um, and then the stick insect on top of that. There's also a um, Lord Howe Island bush cockroach as well, which is only found on Blackburn Island, which is in the lagoon. So a similar story. Um, and centipedes and yeah, there's quite a few other species. So we kind of fit within that. Um, there are some community concerns around predation for the stick insect. So we know from doing um, plant um, plant trials with what species they do eat that they will eat quite a few species. So early on here at the zoo, we were feeding them on tree lucerne, which is a introduced as a weed in most places. Um, mm -hmm. We were feeding them on that and we thought they were really fussy. They wouldn't feed on all the normal species that we use for all our other stick insects. But as mm -hmm. it turns out, they're not that fussy. They just like plants from Lord Howe Island which makes sense. <laughs> so um, the community are concerned about grazing pressure as well. So there'll be, um, there was an owl species that went extinct and they brought in another owl species so that that was also part of the eradication. So they'll be bringing back the owl species that should be there. I don't, well, the endemic one doesn't exist anymore. So they're looking at which, which species genetically is most similar. So they'll probably come before the stick insect we're not sure. It's still um, in discussion. I just got dive bombed by a pile of. <laughs> I can see. I can see that. It, it, what a lovely thing to be dive bombed by. And um, just thinking, even though you're locked up with uh, COVID nineteen in Melbourne, and the Melbourne people are so restricted, how lovely is it that you're part of something larger and that you can continue? Uh, it, it really gives me heart when I hear um, what you know hear you being involved in such a, a project and I would love to get to Lord Howe Island. Oh. Um, so another question, <laughs> another question I've got, if you could choose any insect to work on at the zoo, what would it be and why? Ooh, oh dear, that's a really hard one. I'm, see, I'm one of these people that has a favourite butterfly and then a favourite stick <laughs> insect and then a favourite robin and a, you know, um, oh. Oh gosh, that's really putting me on the spot. Um, I think probably it would be a butterfly um, because my history with working in invertebrate husbandry is I started with butterflies and it's kind of carried on. So I think I'd probably choose the cruiser. So with the cruiser, I don't think there's any really close to me, but um, they feed on a food plant called Adenia. And um, we find it hard to breed them in, not breed them, to rear them in winter. So they get, the food plant gets a bit tough. So there's still a few challenges with that one. Um, so probably that one. They've also got really characterful little caterpillars that are really, like they're busy. They're always active and moving around. Yeah. I really like those. Another cool fact with those is that the males will land on people in here, urinate on them to dissolve oh. the skin on your skin and then drink it. So I think like that too. Yeah, and you're probably the only one that knows that. Yeah. yeah. And so I've got another question here. There's, they're coming in thick and fast. Are the zoo, is zoo, Vic, zoo Vic looking at other invertebrates to add to their fighting, uh, to fighting extinction list? Uh, yes. So it's actually a lot more challenging than what we thought it would be. So... In Australia, um, and particularly in Victoria, our knowledge of uh, what invertebrates we have is um, is quite limited compared to somewhere like 
um, the UK or Europe or even America, um, a lot of the taxonomic work just hasn't been done. So we know that there are a lot of species out there, but what what they're up to, what their numbers are like, long-term data sets, it's actually really rare. Um, I watched uh, Dr. David Yates talk, I think it was last week, and um, he was talking about that as well. And he said, um, there's only three species in Australia where we know that they've been affected by climate change. One's the bogong moth, so yay, we're doing something mm. about that. Um, mm. One's the keys matchstick grasshopper, and again, yay, we're doing something about that. And then the other was the um, green carpenter bee, which would, if I had my choice, would be the next one on the list. But um, because it's currently extinct in Victoria, um, those species are really challenging for us. Um, if, if they're found in Victoria, we can do a little bit more with them. Um, yeah, so last time we looked at all those species, that was the really big challenge. And um, I think we chose the right species. Uh, definitely, we chose the right species, but there's so there's just so many um, options within vertebrates. It's just you know never ending. But having a really cool story and some good actions that we can achieve, um, that's that's really key to the decision making process. Yeah, well, you'd think that uh, go the golden ray blue butterfly would be it because it only is in Victoria, so it's like it, it is in the COVID bubble and it should be given a few um, high fives for <laughs> being, you know, and that you're looking after it. And um, I think I did have a comment that um, it's growing, it's um, in the town of Horsham at the moment, which is in our Wimmera area, uh, due to the um, part of the... Uh, Bubiella yeah. being grown uh, there, so which is which is really great. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any more trips planned to Bull's Pyramid yourself? I wish. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are hoping. We've kind of got this um, long-standing plan to get out there and collect more animals. Uh, we were hoping to do it in um, uh, autumn this year, but again, COVID couldn't make that happen. Um, at the moment, Lord Howe Island um, are not able to have visitors either, and um, that keeps getting extended, extended to protect their population out there, the people's population. Um, so at the moment, uh, no, but as soon as, well, we don't know when things you know, return to normal, but um, yes, as hopefully soon we can get back out there. Um, we have, you know, the permits in place to be able to collect to bring in that you know, really, really valuable genetic material. It's a beautiful place. Too. It's just, it, it's indescribable, Bald Pyramid. Uh, people, I've met a lot of rock climbers over the years that were able to climb it back in the 60s and 70s. And their description of it, I was like, oh yeah, you know, sounds pretty nice. But when you, when that boat's heading towards it and you can see it, it's, it's just incredible. And being one of the very few women that's been able to stay on Bull's Pyramid. Yeah. I just felt so privileged and seeing the bird life and being part of that amazing scientific expedition. There's papers online that you can find out about it. Um, yeah, it was just such a privilege, such a privilege. And Lord Howe Island itself is spectacularly beautiful. Oh. I think you must be the envy of everyone listening today because you're just painting such a picture, which is fabulous. Um, so, Kate, <laughs> are you working with Gardens for Wildlife and encouraging homeowners to be more insect aware? Yes. So, um, as I was saying, that program is really in its infancy at the moment. So, we're, again, in the kind of planning stages, but yes, that they will definitely be ones that we'll be approaching and looking at how we can work together. Um, yeah, I think we're in a really good, good's probably not the right word, but the environment at the moment post bushfire and with COVID, this is the time to really jump on board with wildlife gardening. Um, I worked in the UK and the difference coming back to Australia compared to how people garden in the UK and how you know, kids know what bugs are in their gardens and that hedgehogs need little hedgehog homes and little um, doors to go between, doors, little, you know, little holes in the fence to go between. You know, that's, it's relatively common knowledge there. But here, 
Um, we're, we're quite far behind on that. We're really not into the wildlife gardening. You know, I walk past houses with, with lawns and yuccas and succulents and these really architecturally designed spaces and I just see it as a, a bit of a wasted opportunity. It's so, so easy to really help butterflies especially and bees. You know, you plant a nectar plant like a native daisy and then find out what the food plant is and you're set, you've already made a difference. I know, exactly. And you did mention a few species I've got in my own garden, being the Basaria and the Myoporum. So I'm glad that they actually are fabulous for the for the butterflies. And um, I think that idea, I always think of it as um, it's a pantry that you're building your garden and it's a pantry for the insects and the birds. And if we could think of it that way, um, you know, it would make a big difference um, as us living um, humans on the landscape, just, just a bit more gently, I suppose. Um, I do have another question here. Does the golden rayed blue butterfly like different species within the Myroporum genius, or is it just the parvifolium? No, as far as I know, it's just the parvifolium. That's what the other thing that I should have mentioned about them that's really interesting and fortunate is um, they're part of a group called Lysenid or blue butterflies. And a lot of blue butterflies have a, a interaction with ants. So you need to have the ant colony to then be able to breed the butterfly. Um, with the golden ray blue, they don't have that. So it actually makes it a lot easier to get that butterfly established in different areas. So going back to the elf and copper butterfly, you won't really get you won't get that butterfly breeding in your garden unless you have the Natonkis ant. Whereas with the golden rayed blue, if you're close enough to where the um, where they are now in their range, then there's every opportunity that they could be coming into your gardens. It's um yeah, it's an amazing opportunity. I'm quite jealous. <laughs> I oh, my garden myself and. Um, on the first day of spring, I had a yellow admiral and a, um, a uh, keep calling them peacock, a uh, painted lady, and I was like, yes! I was so excited. <laughs> I think that might have been me when I uh, saw that for the first time a blue banded bee in my garden. I was just jumping up and down, and, and my family thought I was nutty. But anyway, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. We we can be a little bit nutty um, and, and nerdy, as I think Pauline was alluding to just before this meeting. You know, in loving the environment and those intricacies that probably I think sometimes it's that we just don't um, consider them. And if we did, and if we had the uh, the eyes of the young children, like Hannah was speaking about, those fresh eyes um, and that sense of wonder that they're building, um, you know, it would make things so much better. So I'm not sure if I've got any more questions. I've got lots of comments and lots of positive ones for you, um, Kate, but we're coming close to the end of our talk. And I'm just seeing these magnificent butterfly fly just past you, goldy brown, come through just... They're beautiful. Anyway. I, I did put some <laughs> here to try and encourage more to come into view shot and they're kind of all under, but there is a there's a blue tiger there and um, they're mostly tropical species, but some are found in Victoria. So blue tigers sometimes will come down and um, common egg flies and caper whites are in here as well. Yeah. Oh no, it's been really wonderful actually listening to you, Kate, and um, I've just there's so many connections I can think of, um, especially that you're looking after the insects. Uh, in Victoria, I used to, as a child, every year go to Omeo, but I don't think I ever saw a Keys matchstick grasshopper, but I will be looking out for them now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. they're tiny, so maybe that's why. Uh, that, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the golden ray blue butterfly, I just think everyone that's here today should go and look at that. Um, it's just an image of it. It, it is as it is, is described. It is truly stunning. So um, thank you for, and the, and the insect, the stick insect. I think that's probably my favourite. So thank you to um, giving us an inside view of what you do. Um, and I imagine there's a lot of children that go through it, a lot of adults that you're um, getting to just think that little bit more um, about the environment, um, especially with the the um, butterfly enclosure that you've got there. So I thank you very much for your time, Kate. We've really appreciated and really love listening to you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, so we're getting very close, got four minutes before we finish, but I would just like to remind everyone that uh, we um, have uh, surveys to fill out and I think the link, links in the meeting chat. Um, so we'd really appreciate that because that makes our um, events run better for next year. Hopefully it won't be online, even though I think it's been a great format um, during COVID times. Uh, and next week, we ha uh, Thursday 24th of September, we have the Fat Tail Donuts. We're looking at those with Emmy, Emily Sakuna, and she's from La Trobe Uni. And we also have Josh Griffiths looking at the platypus, and he's done a fair bit of work in the Wimmera, and he's from Caesar. So they're two great guest speakers we've got next, next week. So um, I'd like to thank Hannah and Kate, um, and just for the contribution they're actually making to the environment and to our community. Um, and I think we're probably ready to uh, wind up. So thank you everyone today. We'll probably finish up. I think that's everything, Pauline. Anything else? No, she's... Beautiful. That's great. Thank you so much, Kate and Hannah. So enjoyable. Can we have more on call? <laughs> <laughs> it would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, Thanks, um, Andrea. Yeah. See you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, you all. Kate. Thank See you, everyone, for coming. Okay, see you later, everyone. Bye.